Okay, so what we'd like you to do instead of chatting someone on the call um, is to think of someone in your professional world, maybe a grantee, a staff member, um, someone who you have been thinking about but haven't really had the chance to reach out. Uh, maybe there's been you know, a more generic communication that's gone to them, but a personal greeting or thought that you wanted to share with them and you haven't had a chance. And I wanna ask everyone to just take a moment and write that down. Um, to yourself, and I'm going to give us a full five seconds to do that. So someone who's on your mind who you haven't had a chance to be in touch with, and just write down a greeting or a thought that you'd like to share with them. Okay, and the challenge that I'd like to offer to you all when we do gatherings or when we do programs, um, relational work is really about building in those moments of connectivity um, into the time together. And so although we couldn't do it within, within ourselves, um, I invite you all when this is done to send that message that you just wrote down to the person um, who you've been thinking about. Um, so now we are going to go ahead and dive in and, and we're going to start by talking about um, defining our terms. What do we mean when we say relational engagement? Um, so David, if you, we can go to the next slide. This definition that we're about to share now is something that was developed at Hill International with a group of people, um, Beth Cousins on the phone included. Um, David, can we go to the next slide? There we are, thank you. Um, so I'll read it aloud, but it is here and will be up on the screen as we're, as we're speaking. So we define relational engagement as the act of reaching others, getting to know them, and connecting with them on the basis of their interests, ambitions, and passions. Relational engagement does not seek to bring those in. We don't use the term outreach very intentionally, but instead relational engagement seeks to understand them and find common interests, offerings, and experiences that meet them where they are. Um, I, I just want to note here, this term meeting people where they are is something that has become um, kind of jargon within the Jewish community and, and I would even say in the broader world. Um, but there are really um, some clear ways, definitions, and we've developed some activities around what does it mean to reach people where they are because it is a key component of engagement work. And lastly, relational engagement prioritizes relationships over participation. We care about and we see people in the community, whether they are showing up at our programs or not. The ways that we do that is what gather and I think relational practitioners think about all the time is who aren't we reaching, how can we reach them, um, and how can we show them that we see them even when they're not showing up. Um, okay, uh, we're gonna go to the next slide. So as Gather DC and in my relational work, um, as we have been talking about engagement and training others in this methodology, um, it became clear that when we talk about relationships, it is always in um, uh, direct kind of conflict with programs. And so what we decided we needed to do was develop a model that showed the value of relational work in the context of programs, not pitting the two against each other or saying that one is inherently bad, but really showing the ability um, and showing this unique value that engagement adds to programmatic offerings. So David, if we can get to the next slide. Um, oh, we're missing one, it's a heartbeat model. Um, so while David pulls that up, I will explain it. Um, so we've just developed what we call Gather's Relational Heartbeat Model of Engagement. And what it shows is a healthy um, uh, cardiac rhythm, a normal cardiac rhythm. And um, at the peaks of, those, um, of that heartbeat are what we call the programmatic offerings. So at the top of the peak, um, those are the moments of bringing people into a room, of the program, of the event, thank you, David, right? The moments of gathering that we refer to as programs. So if you think about the way organizations often plan their year, they put together a calendar of programs. And that's what we are referring to in the high beats. Well, as you can see from the normal cardiac rhythm, those happen at discrete times and places, and there's a great amount of distance in between those peaks. 
And so what we refer to in the small beats, that is the relational work. That is where we are connecting with people outside of programmatic offerings, where, they're in, where we're in relationship and ongoing communication with them. Um, and this is where um, those kind of formal gatherings that are happening are not reaching everyone. And if we can exist in these smaller beats, then that is where we believe um, there are the largest gaps right now in Jewish communal um, connection. But what this does show is that programs still play a vital role and a significant role in the Jewish landscape. There are moments that can be relationalized. There are moments that um, offer times for connectivity, um, but they alone are not enough. So organizationally, we spend the majority of our time um, and energy on these programs. And so what Gather is um, working towards, and, and there are a field of people who are doing the same, is to focus more energy, time, infrastructure, resources on the small beats, on this connective tissue, the white space, the, the glue that permits the programs to be um, successful. And what this does, this heartbeat model, is it flips the paradigm. Instead of saying that the follow through, the relational work, the things that you know, are often the last agenda item and we, when we do a postmortem from an event and the things that often drop to the bottom, it actually tells us that that is the work. That is, that is what we should be focusing on, is who are we talking to? What are we hearing? Um, and that really is what we have found um, this model allows us to say. Instead of asking the question, what program should we plan to meet this need? We ask the questions, who are we meeting? What are we hearing? And how can we be in deeper relationship with the people that we are trying to serve? Um, Gather DC a couple months ago, before any of this happened, um, we declared January a small beats month, which basically meant we were not gonna have any experiences or gatherings in person. We're just going to do our relational work. What does that even look like? You know, how do we fill a month with work if it's not planning programs? Um, and I'm happy to talk more about this at another time, but um, it was a chance for us to say, there is so much of this work to be done. We just aren't all thinking um, about what that work looks like and building in again, the relational infrastructure, relational systems um, and the relational time that it, it takes um, and the return on that investment um, is immense. So um, I'm about to turn it over to Beth Cousins, um, but before I do, I just wanna say, we all know that we are living in an increasingly networked um, society and meaning, belonging, and connection are happening outside of institutional offerings. And so this relational work, while it's been happening for over a decade, and I think we're getting more and more sophisticated in our approach to it, um, this really is an incredible time, especially if we look at where we are right now, um, we're gonna be very limited in the in-person programs. I think already after a few weeks, the Zoom um, oversaturation is becoming clear. And so I think there is an increasing amount of um, potential and opportunity in exploring how relational work um, can advance our Jewish community and Jewish connection. Um, and now I'll turn it over to Beth um, to talk about the sociological context in which we view this work. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks so much, Rachel. And thanks, everyone, for being here. I was just going to say, David, you're, you're on top of it. Um, it's really a pleasure to see everyone. So many people I've been thinking of and, um, and you know, seeing your work from afar and wondering how you're doing. So it's, um, it's great to be able to connect however uh, tenuous this connection may be. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk through a bunch of concepts. Some of it you've heard before. Um, a little bit of it is my Torah or other people's Torah. Um, and before I even do that, I want to I wanna share a vision of um, maybe North American Jewish life, maybe global Jewish life. Um, the vision has two pieces. One piece, is, um, one piece is that no one ever leaves a program anonymous. Meaning, I think we've all had the experience, or maybe I'm assuming, maybe just many of us have had the experience of walking into, I think this is true for me in my life, of particularly going to synagogue, but it's probably true for many things, walking into a program, being present, um, and leaving without ever really having talked to anyone more than maybe nodding at them to, you know, when you're getting a piece of 
coffee cake from the table, right, or something like that. Um, so one piece of the vision is that nobody ever leaves a program anonymous. Everyone has had some kind of meaningful conversation with somebody when they were there um, and, and leave something having felt recognized and valued and known. So that's one piece of the vision. And the other piece of the vision is that everybody, everybody has a micro Jewish community to celebrate life with, not even just Jewish life, but life with. And the Jewish community answers the question, you know, the, the thing that's constantly in my head is um, in the middle of the night, when something happens to your spouse, to one of your kids, right? Who's gonna stay at home with your other kids? This probably doesn't apply to all of you, but you get the point, even if it doesn't apply to you. Who's gonna stay at home with your other kids when you have to go to the ER in the middle of the night? Um, Jewish community can answer that question, right? So, so the vision is everyone feels known, everyone has a micro Jewish community that they can really depend on. And the question is, how do we get there? Um, and I think Rachel gave us the model of the very micro model of what a relationship is. And I'm going to talk about why this vision matters in the year 2020. Putting coronavirus aside for a second, um, although I, I think at the end of the story, we'll see it's more relevant than ever. Um, David, can you go to the next slide? Okay, great. Um, Rachel, I was going to say um, you gave the opposite, uh, the, the, the flip half of Facebooking, right? We see on Facebook everybody's lovely like homeschool questions. This is what's really going on in many of our houses. So, um, so many of you have heard this before. This is not my Torah. This is Lisa Colton's Torah. Um, Lisa Colton of Daring Consulting in Seattle. So much of the 20th century was defined by a hub and spoke model of organizational life. Hub and spoke meaning there was a strong center, there was a strong um, boundary around whatever the community was. The center of the, um, of the structure pushed power out to members, held power and pushed power out to members. It was very hard to break into the structure. It was very hard to get out of the structure. It was very clear um, you know, what the structure was. We can think of probably a lot of, um, of models or examples that fall into this hub and spoke model of life. Certainly this applies to Jewish communal life for sure. It also applies to lots of membership organizations in the 20th century, um, uh, religious life in general, particularly from the you know, post-war. Um, it was very hierarchical, it was power contained and held, but knowledge was power and so there wasn't a lot of transparency um, to the to the edges of the um, you know of the community near the near the boundary. Um, there's probably other things we can say about it. Hard to get in. Hard to get. In. Thanks. Okay. So again, you've seen this before. So this is the some of you have seen this before. So this is the flip half of the hub and spoke model. Um, so. Um, and what he wrote, he wrote a book called Here Comes Everybody. He wrote other things as well. In Here Comes Everybody, he says um, the way we communicate changes society. The way we communicate changes society. And so what we've seen from the 20th century into the 21st, and it might be also that it's just a reaction to the sort of very power-driven 20th century, is a dispersion from the hub and spoke model into a network model. So again, it might be just a reaction to the 20th century, and it's clearly also because of the internet. Because the way that we communicate on the internet is flat, it's not hierarchical, power is owned by everybody, it's immediate and direct, there are many, many, many centers of power, um, and it's easy to it's easy to connect to that center. Power is very accessible. All of those things, right? So that all of those traits define the network. This is the world in which we live today. This is the world that I think particularly younger people expect, um, but even older people are heavily influenced by this and less simply less interested in uh, an, a powerful organization because it's powerful. So again, let me be really clear about some of the aspects of this model. Um, there, are, there might be defined peripheries, but there are boundaries, but they're much more like peripheries. They're much easier to move in and out of. They're permeable. Um, and just by definition, a network is flatter. Um, uh, what else can we say? There might be centers of power on the periphery simply because um, those centers of power have lots of connections to other nodes in the network. Again, probably other things we can say about this, but those are probably the critical things. Um, David, can you go to the next slide? So what I want to say about that is there's a gift in um, there's a gift in the network model of organizing, right? The gift is if we're if we're living in a world of networks, it also means we're living in a world of relationships. We're living in a world where um, what's what's important, what's valuable, is not the relationship with the center, but the relationship with each other. And what that means for organizing, and to be crass, what it means for recruiting, is that 
we can structure a community in relationships and not in um, not by drawing people toward a core. So this is a picture given to us by Clay Shirky from Here Comes Everybody. And on the left, what he draws is 10 people who are connected in a tight circle. And when I look at that circle, I, I usually think, and I had a great youth group experience, but I usually think of a youth group board or sort of a traditional, a traditional youth group board, a traditional Hillel board, even a traditional young leadership board or you know, a women's philanthropy board, any group of people that are very tight and close and constantly programming for themselves over and over again. That is one model of organizing. It's a closed model of organizing. It's very hard to draw people in. When we can use relationships, the relationships that already exist on Facebook, in real life, right? The many networks that we live in. When we can use networks for organizing, we can connect to many more people. Here he, Clay Shirky, just shows two groups of five people organized in two networks. But the point, of course, is that if you're organizing by networks, you can connect to many more groups of five people. So suddenly, and you can have one group that's connected to one group of five and another group of five and another group of five. So suddenly you can organize 100 people through networks versus the 10 people who are just talking to themselves over and over and over again. So this is just my daughter because I wanted you to look at something while I talked for a little bit. Um, so what, I, what I'm not diving into deeply here, it's my daughter, Sela, she's a preschool. Um, so what I'm not diving deeply into here, but we could spend a long time on, is Jewishly why this matters. Um, so from, a, from an American perspective or from a Western society perspective, it matters because we're really just, I'm just repeating myself, we're really living in a world where hierarchy is down and networks are up and we all want a piece of the power and we all expect to have a piece of the power. Jewishly it matters, of course, because our networks are less Jewish, right? Um, and another piece of research I'm not bringing but just want to mention really briefly um, here's my door opening. Um, just want to mention really briefly is um, all of the research about social behavior being enforced by friends. So we have two things that are true. One is not all American Jews, but many American Jews are living in networks that are less and less densely Jewish. So even, I'm from Detroit, even in Detroit, there are more and more people that I grew up with who instead of living in the core of Jewish community are living on the periphery. And now I live in San Francisco, which is certainly a great example of the fact that Jews are incredibly dispersed um, and very often not looking necessarily for Jewish community in which to live. And that means they have very few natural friendships in their day-to-day -day lives that reinforce their behavior. And again, I said this very quickly, I'm going to say it again very quickly. Um, we know from a lot of other research, um, if you want to look for the book, the book is called Connected. And if you find the book called Connected, you'll find the authors and the authors have a TED talk. Um, uh, we know from, the, from a lot of um, research on behavior that um, you are a lot less likely to smoke if your friends don't smoke. You are a lot more likely to exercise if your friends exercise. You are a lot more likely to go to family camp if your friends mention family camp to you and also go, right? So all of our behaviors are reinforced by our friends. Jewish friends equal Jewish behaviors. Uh, next slide. So this is the last thing I wanna say. Um, so, so what do we know? We know sociologically, sociologically we're living in a networked time. Um, we know that we need Jewish friends because Jewish friends resource, reinforce Jewish behaviors. Um, we also know that in the context of a relationship, learning happens. So um, here I drew a very bad version of um, the zone of proximal development. You have also probably seen this before, and this is my, my last piece of Dina. Um, you have also probably seen this before. Um, this is Vygotsky's uh, understanding of learning. The idea being that we all have something that we can do and we all have something that we absolutely can't do. And learning happens when we're living in the place of what I can do with help. This is, again, a very simple example. Forgive me, Vygotsky, but it is what it is. Um, when we're pushed into the zone of what I can't do, we're simply too overwhelmed and we can't learn. There's a bunch of research. Um, there's a... I can't see it. I don't know if you can see it. Um, there's a piece on the bottom of the slide that, that offers their names. There's a bunch of research by, um, hopefully I'm going to get their names right, Etienne Lave and Jean Wenger. Sometimes I reverse them. It might be Jean Lave and Etienne Wenger. Anyway, it, the research is on situated learning. They use a lot of words that have more, um, my PhD advisor would call them 25 cent words, a lot of words that are very long, legitimate peripheral, peripheral participation that just mean that when we look for information, we look for it in our friends 
So again, like I'm going to turn to parenting or when you move to a new place, you look for people who've done the experience before to learn the most from. Um, and the research on this thing called situated learning is basically the, the idea that we always learn the most in context. So what a relationship does, it doesn't just reinforce Jewish behavior. What a relationship does is it gives us a context, a Jewish context, to validate what we're doing, to help us ask questions safely, um, and to help us move from what I can't do to what I can do in a very safe way. There's, again, like I think probably more I can say about that, but I'm worried about repeating myself. So I'm going to pause there, um, and hopefully we'll have good questions and conversation. Karen and Adina, take it away. Thank you um, very much, Beth. So originally this was going to be, we were all going to be in the same room. David tells me there's approximately 50 people uh, that are on this um, call right now. Um, feel free, please, to use the chat box. Let us know that you're here, who you are, where you're calling from, or calling in from. Um, it's always nice to know which colleagues um, are sitting around our virtual table. Um, so thank you to Beth and Rachel for giving us um, some of the theoretical about this. The next part of this, uh, session is designed to um, give a little bit of context to our colleagues from a funder perspective. Um, Karen will introduce herself and share about the work, um, the relational engagement work that, that they've been funding, um, the 18 Foundation has been funding it, <coughs> sorry, um, with Honeymoon Israel um, and potentially other things. And then I'll be sharing um, about the work that the Morningstar Foundation has been doing a little bit of a case study um, from Different, two different case studies from two different funder perspectives, uh, both what's happened, some of the challenges, et cetera, and then we'll be uh, structured. Please feel free along the way to use the chat box um, and then later uh, to give us either questions or topics that would be helpful to have a group discussion about afterwards. So, Karen? Sure. Um, so I can't, I'm, I'm in this weird place with, with uh, Zoom, whether my glasses, I'm too close, I'm too far, so I'm gonna take them on and off as, as I adjust. Um, you know, it's interesting, oh, if, you, if you're in the doing this work long enough, I think you do tend to see that um, ideas and themes reappear and they reappear with different research behind them, different context, different language. And, um, you know, just thinking back from the early 90s um, when I was more involved as a lay leader to now working um, for a funder and seeing some of the kind of best practices that work. And I think relational engagement is always at the core of it. Um, and it has been, and I think we see it in a lot of things that are appearing now that are very hot and uh, attracting our attention. So for example, a lot of people are talking about design thinking and design thinking principles. And if you think about design thinking principles, um, it's always about understanding who the individual is. And if you think about that in the context of engagement, um, the understanding of who that individual is and making an individual connection as opposed to a product per se is usually um, where the best answers lie, especially in a time where things are constantly changing and product or services, you know, the kind of at the top of the heartbeat, um, they need to be fluid, they're constantly changing and evolving, and the really good ones are defined by the individuals in relationship to, that, to the organization. So um, I just want to mention, I'll mention two things that we do, and again, I, I tend to bristle at the constraints of the language, so you may or may not uh, consider it um, relational uh, engagement and Beth and, and Rachel, you can chastise me, me later. Um, but uh, one is Honeymoon Israel and um, we as a foundation, I work with the 1-8 Foundation based in Boston and a big piece of our focus around Jewish engagement is on what we tend to call the least engaged. So these are people who have either been marginalized by the community because they, they, they don't fit a standard kind of, they haven't followed a standard path, or perhaps they just are not interested, have never been engaged, um, and institutional life is actually irrelevant to them. And so the context of understanding programming doesn't, make, doesn't necessarily matter. And what we find, particularly in programs like Honeymoon Israel, is that those individuals are seeking meaning and connection and community and relationships. And, um, 
and it doesn't really matter to them necessarily um, whether they, you know, what, what the organization is actually trying to relay to them. It matters whether it's speaking to their needs at the moment and whether it can be in genuine relationship with them. So for Honeymoon Israel, for example, these couples are in relationship with each other and they're in relationship with the organization because the organization um, is engaging them in a way that uh, connects with them personally, um, enables them to connect with each other, which is a different dynamic than we think about individual, enga individual engagement. And, and most importantly, what we saw after the first year or so is that most of the people who apply to Honeymoon Israel are finding out about it through their peer groups. So these are not through lists that are given through organizations or the Federation necessarily, although that was the starting point. What we find is that people become, you know, advocates to the organization and then they tell their friends to, to participate. And what that does is it builds this web and, and we Early on, when we were doing some design thinking for them, we actually had them, we had someone map out their relationships. And it looked very much like that chart that you put up, Rachel, I think it was. Um, and you could really see how the relationships are fluid with each other, with staff potentially, um, and how those relationships continue to evolve, especially through um, virtual reality, not virtual reality, virtual engagement. Um, the other I'll mention is one that Yona Schiller and Charlie Buckholz have led, which is kind of going into Hillel's and using design thinking to help some Hillel's kind of rethink their, how they do their work. So specifically to Rachel's example, in most of those cases, they've gone in and the traditional boards of kind of insiders and the way that they've operated will often disband or they, their role becomes different. And through relational engagement to people in the community, um, you actually build a much broader network. And those individuals begin to create the programs, the engagement opportunities, the content within the Hillel. So no longer is it that kind of, you know, what you had on the left side, Rachel, it's much more becoming what's, what's on the right side. Um, and again, that allows a lot of fluidity, a lot of change, and it also allows people to navigate their way, way through. And I think one reflection of this is, um, is the success of this in general, all of this work, is that many years ago, people tended to identify with an institution. And now we know, and we've known for many years with young adults in particular, that they don't necessarily engage with an institution, one institution or identify. They identify with multiple institutions that meet multiple needs in their lives. They're in relationship with multiple organizations or multiple individuals. And that to me is success because we as a community are so diverse and we should be diverse. And there's all this talk about us siloing off and everybody just engaging in what they want to engage. I actually have a more optimistic view of it. And I think that this kind of relational work allows people to be engaged with all kinds of different things that they may never have been engaged with before because it doesn't have to reflect all of who they are. It can be a relationship, not the only relationship. So I think the work you know, of gather, um, of a lot of organizations that are doing this well are so, so important. And I think especially at this time of, of crisis and um, the, the organizations that really are based on the relationships as opposed to the programs or the infrastructure um, are, re are well positioned to meet the needs and maintain community. And so how do we leverage that? Um, especially now, I think we're, we're set up to do it really well. Um, so I'm going to share a few words um, from a perspective working in my case for the Morningstar Foundation, um, which is a, or an organization that does certainly fund a variety of um, sets of innovative work um, and has tended actually not to fund as much startup kind of work uh, like this. And I'd like to talk a little bit about um, some of the journey, um, you know, of how the foundation decided to begin to fund in the relational engagement space and um, provide a little bit of advice for other foundations, other individual donors that may be along for this kind of ride within your own communities, your own entities, et cetera. 
<laughs> so um, it's a little hard to, because we don't know who's in the room. Um, if there are, I see that there are some people, Arnie Winchell, Tamar Rem, um, have made themselves known. Um, you know, I, it's unclear exactly who of us are in the room and to what degree this is preaching to the choir, to what degree this is talking with colleagues who may be considering making investments um, in a different kind of way of, not a different way of grant making, but a different kind of uh, grant or different kind of organization um, that they otherwise may have invested in to date, or um, if these are individuals, we just don't know who is, um, is here for the most part. Um, so I'll just say a few words. So the Morning Star Foundation um, is a family's private foundation. Um, as I mentioned, the foundation has not generally invested in a lot of startup organizations, although certainly over time has. Um, our board members are very actively involved in the work that the foundation does, very actively involved in the, in the grant making processes. And we have a small staff um, that, um, that works um, alongside and, and in concert with, with our board. You know, I think something that's really important about relational engagement um, that we can all relate to in whatever ways is that people make a difference. Like we know that people make a difference. Um, and one of the stories that Michael Gelman um, from the Morningstar Foundation has shared a, a number of times in a number of settings. So I'm comfortable sharing it um, at a high level here um, is that when he recalls the path to how he became involved in the Jewish community, he went to a young leadership event in the greater Washington, D.C. area X number of years ago, and that X is for him to share at a later point if he wants. Um, but, to, and he was, he began a relationship, a conversation, and then a relationship with the particular professional who worked at the young leadership um, office, the young leadership staff person at that time. And really that began his involvement in the Federation. And over time, um, it was through the Federation that a lot of personal things kind of came into place for him. Um, and he made personal connections and et cetera, et cetera. It's not my story to tell, but I think that it kind of can help us all to remember how in any of our journeys, whether professional, personal, in between, um, <coughs> sorry, um, we, have all been affected by individuals and individual relationships along the way. As, Morning, as the Morning Star um, Foundation decided, in this case, the foundation made a significant um, grant, an evolution to revolution, no, revolution, evolutionary grant to gather DC um, a number of years, five or six years ago. Um, we, at that time, the foundation had been looking for ways to engage with young adults. Um, the, at that point was the millennial population, answering the question of how to engage young adults in Jewish community in a variety of different ways. And we had gone through a large process, done a lot of research, spoke to many of you, some of who are probably on this call, um, about what was working and not working in your communities. And we didn't even know, the foundation didn't even understand that what the foundation was looking to fund was relational engagement. Um, this was all happening kind of at the same time that a lot of the language was starting to come out from this. We, the foundation had done research and drew very heavily from the Hillel space, um, from the, the really you know, monumental work of the Senior Jewish Educator Program, et cetera. The CE, well, at that time was the CEI program at Hillel International and thought about what does it look like to take this research, to take these programs, and now we don't use the language of programs in the same way, but how do we take this language and this idea of, these ideas of programs and, and bring them into the post-college space? And that really began a journey for the foundation, which um, has led to our, you know, our board having to approach our grant making in this way in a different, in just a different way than the foundation, um, you know, may otherwise generally approach grant making. Um, I think that, you know, that we've learned lessons along the way. We've learned lessons in partnership with our colleague, Rachel, obviously, with her leadership with Gather being one of them, uh, with our grantees, with colleagues um, like, <coughs> like the Ordate Foundation, like many other, found other foundations and programs that um, the foundation funds in addition, of, especially around the question of data and what is, I think we're all still learning. We all have ideas and we're all still learning about how we um, express success in this um, express success in terms of how relational engagement works. That's something we can talk a little bit about. My, I just saw some questions. I'm still getting used to the Zoom modality um, of both reading and talking at the same time. So we'll, we'll certainly talk about that. 
Um, I guess one other thing I just want to mention, um, which hasn't really been manifest, it's a lesson that we've learned here at the Morningstar Foundation, and I, I'm curious if my colleagues um, agree, um, but we've learned it's not only, relational engagement is critically important, and that's what here what we're talking about, and we know that it has to be authentic, and it, need, we're, it does not matter if we're talking about authentic at a preschool space, or we're talking about an older adult space, or whatever, or millennial, Gen Z, it's not only about the relationships. Relationships are critically important, and it needs to be about content. Um, the con it's something that the Morningstar Foundation certainly feels strongly about and has been investing not only in people getting together, right, because we know that this is different than just pure socializing, 100%, um, and <coughs> we know that there needs to be content. The foundations help to support, you know, Jewish education, a community rabbi, et cetera, in this case, to work with Gather DC and, and Millennial Gen Z. Um, because we really believe that people are seeking content and authenticity, and especially in the Jewish space, um, then that we need to have the um, we need to have that be really critical uh, a critical component of designing any of these programs. One last piece is from a a, um, a funder perspective, from a foundation perspective. You know, there certainly are moments where things in relational engagement land, as we many of us know, don't. Uh, don't always go according to plan because the population is constantly changing and the population is constantly learning, figuring out or learning from what we understand, what we've seen, what it is that they need. And a lot of times in designing programs or opportunities for individuals to engage, what people say they want or say they need is not actually what they want and need. And this may be something um, that others may want to respond to, but it's something that we've certainly seen and it's a big difference between um, the kind of work that the foundation in many other ways funds, that many, many of us fund um, and our foundations we work for fund in, in different ways. Um, but it, it's kind of, a, it is a disconnect that, that just exists. Asking people what they, what they want and what they actually need. I think of it sometimes like a supply and demand problem and where like the locus of control is, it's just really different. Um, great, so with, with that, I think we're gonna move towards um, a conversation um, and um, I, I perhaps- oh, it's, you know, you, I know you've been talking, so I um, just to give you a second to catch up on the chats. I think what we're gonna do now is open it up and people can ask questions by raising their hands. Wonderful. And unmute that. If in the meantime, I think there were a couple of questions, um, maybe one that people want to get started on while we, while we wait for that. Um, someone asked how we can, um, how funders can help institutions, or I think this should be for everybody, switch how they work. We're working closely, this, or, this person is working closely with their local federation um, to be more inclusive and to do more of this work. And what have you all seen um, has worked to encourage other organizations to, to do this? Great. Uh, so I can, um, can start responding and then others can jump in. Um, so I, Deanna, I, so I see you're, it also says that um, you don't have many other community organizations to invest in. So that's actually something that from what we've seen at the Morningstar Foundation is critically important. We talk about that relational engagement cannot happen in, um, in a vacuum and that we need to create and part of the foundation's funding strategy specifically for young adults, Jewish young adults in the greater Washington area. But part of our funding strategy is making sure that we have set out an ecosystem um, and are supporting the ecosystem, um, not only of, you know, of this particular organization, these one or two or three particular organizations, but really building up the larger ecosystem um, in order to to cultivate um, to cultivate community organizations, and I think that there's pieces of training um, that may and that are real opportunities um, as well. And I think that's some of the work that JFNA is doing as well on a national scale. Gather certainly doing that locally in the Greater Washington area, and and Karen, I'm sure that there's work you all have done in Boston around this. Yeah, I was just going to say the best thing you can do, I think, to encourage organizations is to ask the question. You know, if you're looking at an organization, again, we're, we're really focused on the le what we call the least engaged, but really look at the data if they have it and if they don't ask the questions, like who are you attracting? 
How are you reaching people who may not be on those existing lists? How are you getting to people? You know, you, you want to ask them questions and guide them and give them ideas and ways to think about it. And then you begin to get them to think in that mindset. Um, and then as far as like funding specific things, I think, you know, or good organizations want to do that. Boston is like, they're really, really good at this. Um, so there has been very little need to, to push them um, to do this work, but to give them the support and to ask the questions and to help them articulate um, what they might need to do to reach more people than the people they're getting in their little inner circle. And that's, I think, the, the greatest value you can add. Um, if I can jump in, I obviously I can't speak to this from a funder perspective, but I, um, I just want to echo um, what was said about language and, you know, just as an organization, very often um, the, uh, the proposals that we submit, the language is all about the programs that we're offering. And so part of it is kind of having an understanding of if we want to change culture and really like rewire towards engagement, the language we use, like Karen said, the questions we ask. Um, the information we want to know. And then what I would say I've also seen is that um, for larger organizations, there's the knowing, okay, we're not reaching people. We want to, you know, make sure that we're being more inclusive and doing better engagement. And then the really knowing how to do that. Um, both of those pieces feel very um, relevant. And I would say probably have different answers, but are like need to happen together. I want to add also, I, I think um, for better or worse, there are, um, I'm going to say people, although there are also whole federations at the front of this and people and whole federations that are sort of behind the curve on this. Um, and in my experience, good ways to push, there's, there's probably two good ways to push. Um, and they both involve making funding available. Um, and they're both extremely ably led by um, private foundations. So one is to make a pool of grants available to any organizations in the community to do a particular kind of work, right? Um, and San Francisco is doing this right now. It happens to be with federation dollars and some private foundation dollars, but I think that's irrelevant. Um, they, um, they seeded relationship-based engagement in the local organizations, particularly for families with young children. Rachel's actually consulting on it. And, um, and the other thing to do is to try to find entrepreneurs. Gather wouldn't exist. Um, if it weren't for a particular vision, it happened to be of GW Hillel at the time. And then, you know, Rachel was able to sort of lead it out of Hillel and lead it independently with Morningstar Foundation funding. Um, that whole process is something that can be led, um, even if it's not by a federation, by a private foundation, um, helping to negotiate that through the federation's processes. I'm happy to talk more offline about that, but it's something I, I'm very passionate about because otherwise we're not going to get to any innovation. This is the best way to get there. I just want to jump in. So thank you so much for saying that, Beth. I'm, um, I'm a bit of a stickler as a fact checker. It's like an occupational hazard of being um, a grant maker and due diligence. So I, what you said is, is correct. Um, but um, Gather actually started, and this is part of the story, um, which is true, um, which is the best part, <laughs> but that of like kind of two guys trying to meet girls and like then eventually found their way to GW Hillel. But I, I really think that it's important for us to kind of just, we sometimes, right, things start in these weird places and are really super uber organic to the community. Um, and then they turn into, for all kinds of reasons, they go through a lot of transition and turn into these other um, entities through lots of funding in our case from Morningstar, but also from others. Actually, there was a different foundation, the EJF Philanthropies that had come in and made a large contribution and engagement in this before Morningstar came to it. But I think like, right, so what can happen over a period of time is actually not what we would expect. And it's in my mind, part of the bit of um, a, the like suspension of this belief, I think that sometimes has to happen um, when we're doing this kind of work. It takes a lot of um, guts for foundations no found, very few foundations would have invested, very few even individual donors would have invested in two guys trying to put together a listserv to meet girls and look at where we are now. And Mark Zuckerberg, right, was at the same time starting this up with Facebook and who would have thought that that's a platform that was being used so you know, widely in a billion dollar company at this point in time. But thank you so much. Are there other comments that we 
Hi. Hi, everyone. It's Hi. the foundation. Um, I love your background, Karen. And uh, Rachel, love your comment to your <laughs> about your children. Um, so many thoughts here, but I just wanted to share, and actually um, one of my colleagues, Tracy Newman, who many of you know, is also on. She manages um, a, a number of different grants for us that are related to family engagement um, with PJ Library that I would call relational and works very closely and with her colleagues, um, we're very closely with Rachel Gildener and, and Beth. So thank you for, for everything you guys have shared. So A, one point is I think so much of what you guys are talking about today is specifically focused on young adults, but very transferable. Um, and there's a lot, I think, both that we've seen and we could speak to a lot more about the similarities and the differences. Um, it's been really interesting that um, through kind of targeted grants based on PJ Library, which I'm assuming most people on this call know what it is, but the idea that we are already in about 230,000, you know, children and families homes every month in North America, um, and that's through community partnerships, that in 30 or so in growing communities, there are targeted programs now with parents who are acting as ambassadors or connectors that um, Tracy and her colleagues manage, many of them initiated by grants we made. So I'll say a couple of things. Just um, one is I think in that kind of format where we are using a, a, a program to build off relational engagement around it, and we're able to often do it through cohorts or numerous communities, in addition to using grants, I'd say really using a lot of training and pulling in people like Rachel for that training has been invaluable. Um, and so I think there's a lot we could share about what's, what's worked, because I totally agree with Karen about, you know, you can often there are times where it's about just asking the questions and getting the organizations to think that way. But in the case of PJ, where I think we've learned, we've been able to be a bit more directed and not only offer a grant, but then also offer this training. Um, and a last reflection, and I don't know if Tracy wants to share anything, but we could certainly also, I'm sure, have a whole other session about relational engagement right now. Because I think while, yes, obviously programs are canceled, um, what's been really astounding to me, and I think everyone's very um, pleased and we're getting a lot of great credit at PJ Library for the things that are happening with um, content that we're providing to families on Facebook pages and and otherwise but um, I think the story that isn't out there and that kind of I'm thinking about as you guys are talking is how quickly many of these parents um, are adapting and creating virtual experiences and there's a lot that we're learning that way and I think relational and engagement in this time is something you know I just wonder if any of you have anything to say about, um, and I think we could all learn a lot together. What I think I can offer here is, um, if you go back to Beth's slides that she shared, um, Tamar, I think that, um, right, the health, the, the measure of a healthy community, whether it's a micro or a larger community, is the number and the strength of relationships between people. And so I think a question to ask, right, like I'm a big fan of um, this woman, Ann Mae Chang, who wrote a book called Lean Impact. And one of the things she says, which I think is so important for us as a Jewish community right now, is fall in love with the problem, not the solution. So the solution might not be more content webinars. The solution might be how, right, like answering the question, how can we connect more people to each other in more ways? Um, and it might start with a lecture by Shai Held or any other scholar who's like giving their Torah to the community in a beautiful way, and then breaking up into a pod of five people. And that is the community that you're actually leaving. Um, and so I think it's like the same question that we're asking in person, but with new solutions that we'll have to come up with um, in this virtual way. I was just gonna just build on this question of content and relationship. And I didn't mention this in, when we were talking about Honeymoon Israel, but they're looking right now at what makes a good, there's usually a rabbi on every trip. What makes a good rabbi on that trip? Because there are lots of other people that these couples are in relationship with. And time and again, the good rabbis are not the rabbis who are, are set on relaying information to the participants. The ones that wanna lead Shabbat the way they wanna lead Shabbat, or they want to teach the way they want to teach. The best ones are the ones that are in relationship with the couples. And then those couples come back and they want to be in relationship. And so I do think in general, this question is we see a lot of emerging spiritual communities as well. Uh, and we see rabbis in all kinds of different contexts and Jewish educators. Um, this is going to be, you know, it'll be interesting to see what that right balance is, how that skill set works. 
Do we start, you know, do, do schools start selecting for that skill set of how to do relational engagement? Is it taught at the rabbinical schools and some of these other programs? In some cases it is, in some cases there's probably more opportunity. Um, but I think, you know, again and again, when we say, oh, people, people don't know enough, they're, they're not showing up for spiritual practice, they're not showing up for Jewish learning. You know, I don't know that it's that they don't want spiritual practice or Jewish learning, it just may be that they're not in relationship. And, um, and I think we really need to acknowledge that, that link and what, we, what that means um, you know, for the organizations that we support or work for. So one of my favorite examples of that, Karen, is um, in DC, I heard after the shooting in Pittsburgh, there were some couples that got together with their honeymoon Israel trip and their rabbi because they had no other Jewish connections, which is probably the subject of another panel, the handoff, right? But let's not, I mean, that's fine. Um, that their, their strongest connection, particularly for meaning and conversation and big questions was with their honeymoon Israel rabbi. And another shout out, their, their trip leader, their honeymoon Israel rabbi um, is part of something called the Den Collective, which is supported by Federation and probably private foundation that I don't know about, um, and United Synagogue 1-8, um, and they are, the rabbis of the Den Connecti Collective are phenomenal examples of really relational pastoral rabbis around life's big questions and meaning, um, not typical pastoral work and not typical rabbinic teaching. I know, um, Arnie, um, I believe you have your hand raised, and you also sent some comments, but if you're going to get unmuted, you can share what you, your, share your words from your voice. Oh, hi, guys, and thank you, all of you. It's a great panel. I was just, there are a number of things that came to mind as people were talking. Um, obviously, there are other organizations also succeeding based on this kind of work momentum. Uh, in the medical field, the whole Gold Foundation, Humanism and Medicine is focused on how relations, the, how doctors can be more relational. But I was also thinking in the beginning, as you were talking, um, working with initially the Avichai Foundation and Mayberg Foundation, and now seated with the Mayberg Foundation and the Jewish Education Innovation Challenge, we started a project called DEEP, uh, Developing Embedded Expertise Project, and reached out to over 18 organizations that do coaching and mentoring inside day schools and brought all these organizations together and and growing out of that helping develop those relationships our capacity building um, potential and and serving the field more effectively and and so even among professionals being able just like what jfn tries to i think facilitate among funders, um, facilitating an opportunity to develop close relationships among these professionals and leaders of these organizations also enables all kinds of other outcomes to happen and strengthening. So I was just thinking about that as you were talking about kind of different populations, but it applies in multiple circles in multiple contexts, the power of this model. And as a developmental psycholinguist, I appreciated what Rachel said about language. Um, we often talk about linguistic determinism and often the language we use helps to develop the abstract and cognitive concepts that then filter down and, and impact our behavior and the way we view the world. So. This is all powerful stuff, thank you. So we have about 10 minutes left for this session. Uh, we don't have to take all of the time, but I would like to invite, um, I guess my co-panelists, anyone who would like to share a closing thought, a closing charge, um, or a closing question, or something that, that you're wondering about right now before we thank everyone and close this out. Um, so, Again, I just, um, 
I'm inspired by the questions um, and by also hearing uh, Karen and Beth and Adina speak um, about this work. And as someone who, again, from a legacy organization like Hillel International that 10 years ago was thinking about new ways of reaching people who were not coming into Hillel's doors and now operating something that's an independent entity and that is really being built from the ground up uh, with a focus on relational engagement and education. Um, I just believe so strongly that this model is possible in many iterations and the ways that we work as a system, truly as a system to understand how each organization can do it authentically and towards their own strengths and focus, it will really uplift all of us. And so, um, you know, using each other for the tools, the resources, the trainings, the language, um, I believe deeply that relational work is and can be a field um, and, and really a movement. And so I am excited um, to see everyone on this call, how we kind of come together to um, advance this continued relational work. And I'm honored to have been a part of this today. And that is actually the first thing I want to say is just a huge thank you to all of the um, funders and foundation professionals and human beings that, that I've gotten the um, privilege of working with closely and also learning from afar over the past few years about this work. Um, I think um, I think the, the richness of relational engagement in Jewish life exists in large part because of your um, not, not just financial support, but really your vision, your high expectations um, and your sense of what's important and how to how to craft that. Um, and how to work with collaborative, collaboratively with, um, you know, field professionals along the way. Um, I really do. I have images of all of your work in my head all the time. Um, so that was one thing I wanted to say. And then, and then point two, um, I, I, building on what Rachel said, I, I really believe that relational work influences everything. Um, the, in the 21st century, we can't afford to let any setting, um, again, I'm going to use my language from before, sort of be anonymous. And so I would just encourage all of us um, to use a relational lens when we look at all of our investments and all of the um, all of the places where Jews gather, no pun intended, today. So, you know, my favorite examples of this um, our schools and the fact that, uh, you know, day schools in and of themselves are phenomenal places where we should be building community, you know, out of classes, out of the whole school, anytime parents gather. Um, uh, and I and I also often use as an example part time Jewish education where um, I, I just constantly wonder if the fourth grade class were really a community and parents had the responsibility of being room parents, just like you did in preschool, um, what would happen at seventh grade if, you know, once the, once the bar, once the B'nai Mitzvah, once the B Mitzvahs all happen, right? Would we really see a drop off or because of that parent community that was built year after year over time, um, you know, would we, would we instead see parent community continuing and those micro communities really comprising a rich synagogue community? So thanks everyone very much. Thanks for having me. And I just wish us all, you know, health and safety during this time. I don't have much more to say, except, I mean, to add to what, what uh, Rachel and Beth said, except let's not think about this as superfluous in this time of, of necessary cost cutting and reduction and focus. Um, to me, this is like the ground, it's the ground underneath which everything we do should um, sit. Um, so let's just like, you know, tough times are great opportunities to refocus what we do um, by using some, some new ways of doing it. So, and hope everyone is well. Great, and I want to just underscore what everyone else has said with um, thanks to my co-panelists, deep thanks and gratefulness for the Jewish Funders Network for bringing this group together um, and for allowing us this this platform virtual is supposed to be in person. Obviously, it would have run a little bit differently and we would have uh, talked, been able to experience some of this. I think that I you know, speak for all of um, the co-panelists and that we're all available if there's anyone on the phone or on Zoom who'd like to follow up. You probably have our contact information or you can find us very quickly or through David at the Jewish Funders Network. Um, and May it be that we can do this in person in a future year um, to have a conversation in person and to learn from each other, continue to learn for each other in, in health and so on um, next year or the year after. Great. Well, thank you all so much. Um, be well.